What's up, everybody? This is Snail Nation ninety eight here. What's up, everybody? It's I Ken Snake. Greetings, everyone. This is CC Trainerling. What's going on, everybody? It's James Conman, and I'm gonna lose your love tonight. And guys, we have a special guest joining us this week. So please introduce yourself. Hello, pet shop host. My name is Ethan. And so, everyone, without further ado, let's jump right into the plot. So the plot here is Zoe asks for Penny Ling to share her feelings about a pet day camper named Digby, with whom she has an infatuation, but is afraid to see him because of a blemish on her nose. Meanwhile, Russell's daydream about attending school gets the better of him when he decides to stow away in Blythe's backpack and ends up getting lost inside the school, and Blythe desperately tries to find him before he's captured by the school janitor. My first positive would definitely have to be Zoe and Penny Ling. Zoe for her freaking out of the minor blemish, and Penny for just being a good friend to both Digby and to Zoe, actually willing to go through this just to, you know, help Zoe talk about her feelings to this Cahill-based pet. I have to agree with Cece. Penny Ling was a very good friend in this episode. She went to talk with Digby for Zoe, so Zoe could try to get Digby to see if she likes him or not. Penny Ling just went along with it throughout the whole episode. Yeah. Oh yeah. Another character I wanted to talk about is this week's guest pet, Digby. Just like we mentioned in our review for Books and Covers, Scout Carrie is based off of the Cahill's pet Siamese cat, while Digby is based off of their pet dog. It's also really funny and cute when he started trying to get with Penny, since Since she started talking with him instead of Zoe. (laughs) Yeah, I actually thought that was pretty interesting as well. I found it really weird how he just, you know, blurts out the most obvious question, Why Why can't Zoe speak speak for for herself? herself? Like, I was thinking the exact same thing when I first watched the episode. Yeah. He's just simply saying what all of us are thinking. And I honestly thought that this is where we were going to find out about Zoe's nose and Zoe reacting to Digby finding out. But no, Digby decides to do his little charm thing with Penny. And I thought that was pretty cool. (laughs) It was a good turnabout. Yeah. Yeah. I think he did that on purpose. (laughs) I don't think it would be jealousy because he probably didn't even know that Zoe had a thing for him. I just, what I was picking up is that Zoe was just talking about how great he was and maybe Digby just didn't feel at the time. And ah, I I don't know. Just the point is, I thought it was a nice little turnabout, like Snake said, and it was very well done. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Another positive I have deals with Zoe's love life. This is the first episode where we get introduced to one of the main pets having a love interest. And since I'm the main Zoe fanboy here, I really love seeing how Zoe deals with her love interest. Since she's all regal and fancy and high society and stuff, she would be the one to find love first. Out of all of her three love interests, I think Digby is the most realistic love interest since they both express feelings for each other and this love interest actually went somewhere. With Juan Jorge Jose, Zoe couldn't do it because it would interfere with her passion in life. And with Philippe, she couldn't do it because he was a mime dog. So Zoe and Digby seem like a cute couple together once you think about it i have to agree here because you know normally i'll be the first to say i am not a big fan of shipping you know even if it's you know supported by the canon you know i'm just it's not really into shipping but i kind of have to agree with, agree with ekans here you know this actually seems like the most plausible of zoe's i don't want to say relationships because they never really were relationships per se just more like crushes because you know philippe again he was a mime dog and you know he's in france so you know they wouldn't even be, be able to see each other even if they were an item mm-hmm. yeah so you know and all the little crushes i think this one will probably work out the best because at least it's local my next positive would have to be russell's little fancy he, he has about attending school I just found it really hilarious how he thinks it's going to be all great with him walking down the hallway, strutting it like, you know, he's the top dog, or in this case, the top hedgehog, being the one to score the winning points in the football game, and getting the best hedgehog in school trophy, or whatever it is that it was called. It, it's it's there, and I love it. Big hedgehog uh, on campus. Tomorrow. Yes, exactly. I thought it was hilarious, too, honestly, because, I don't know, this part of me was just thinking, like, college movies and, you know, all sorts of sort of um, fantasies where people used to be, like, the top guy back in high school or college. And, um, you know, you know Ru- I thought Russell would probably have, like, more of a fantasy about, yeah, I don't know, about the studious side of school, more so than the you know, wanting to be the, the best that no one ever was. <laughs> <laughs> the next positive I have listed would be Minka's little distraction scene to keep Mrs. Twombly out of the day camp. 
Now before I started watching any full-length episodes to the series, I used to go on YouTube and watch random clips from random episodes posted by Apple, Jerry, and Snake. And I really couldn't form an opinion at the time because these were just random clips. But then I stumbled upon a clip from this episode, and that's when my curiosity for the show really started to peak. It was a clip where I was first introduced to the character of Minka, and more so to Mrs. Twombly. This was the first Minka scene I ever saw, and I instantly fell in love with this monkey. She was so adorably cute and trying to keep Mrs. Tom distracted with all the tummy rubs and the head scratching and of course to seal the deal, the chasing of the doorknob. Oh yeah. Uh. <laughs> You'd have to be made of stone to not feel warm inside seeing it. Yeah. <laughs> Especially how I named the video on my channel. Minka, when are you not being cute? That's a good question. That is her sole purpose. Well, you can say that for any of them, honestly. First she's used as a distraction in books and covers, now she's a, a distraction here. The scene with the doorknob chase was just really funny and cute. <laughs> Especially the part where Mrs. Tommy jumps for the doorknob and then she just like takes the doorknob and then she's like, Tommy, Minka, you make a delightful diversion. Something like that. One of my last positives is right near the end of the episode where Blythe is trying to make it back to Littlest Pet Shop before Mrs. Twombly realizes that Russell is gone, and she needs to find a way to get back there as fast as she can. She ends up in an alley, and what does she use to get back to the pet shop? That's right, a skateboard. She has to quickly make a skateboard out of very little items she finds in an alley, and to make it that quick in that short amount of time, and to have it actually work and just stop in style when she gets there, she has some hidden potential here, and I think she really needs to expand more on that in future episodes. Let's hope she expands on it. I think, you know, for her being solely involved in the world of fashion as her main hobby, she definitely has some great, I guess you can say, mechanical skills. Yeah. The other thing that I liked about it was that, uh, I don't know if you can consider this a fourth wall break, but when she's like, Man, yeah, the things you can make, like, I forgot no what time. the actual line is, but it sounds like it would be a fourth wall break. With very little back? time? Something yeah. like that? Yeah. The things you can make in such no, like no little time. Yeah, I don't know if I can consider it a MacGyver. but I thought that was pretty funny. <laughs> oh yeah, she was totally pulling a MacGyver here. Yeah. The only thing I was missing was a mullet and, you know, aviator sunglasses, and there you go, she's MacGyver. And of course the theme song that just happens to fit everything. I, I, I call this like a minor pause of it because it wasn't a big moment, but I kind of like the part where Peppo just decided to be a, a leader for a moment in the show. I think it was kind of cool. It was small and short, though, but I think it's just a little minor positive. <laughs> hey, I'm not going to argue with you, man. Yes, says the biggest Pepper fan here, James. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got the call snake ever being a, a Zoom fan. Yeah. Yeah. Got me there. <laughs> I guess that would go to the negatives. Ekans negatives are back this week. <laughs> Bad That's news, a... Ekans. I'll spare you this time. Since I really haven't said much about positives, because everyone basically hit the nail right on the head with my positives, so I'm just going to say one little nitpick. My nitpick would definitely have to be the fact that Russell, out of all seven, had to be the one to do something so reckless like this. Now, I can forgive him for it because he is a pet and he probably didn't understand the idea that you can't have animals in school. I mean, granted, they didn't know that a human doctor is not called a humanarian, so like it's it's understandable, but I don't know. I just felt like, why would he be the one of all seven to do something like that? I mean, it seems like, like Vinny or something would do that, you know? But yeah. That's all I got to say about that. My negative kind of also stretches off from Sunil's, too. I get that Russell really wanted to visit Blight School and all, but this causes a lot of problems. Since the school is an animal-free zone like it should be, and since he's a hedgehog who looks like a rat, it makes for very unsanitary conditions in the school. I'm sure that most schools in real life have common checkups to see if the school is performing satisfactorily, both academically and sanitarily. If Russell were to be caught, not only would it be bad for Blythe, but it would also be bad for the school in total. In a worst case scenario, the school could be evacuated, it could be closed down, or it could even be shut down due to animals and insects infestation, and them being able to wander the school like that on their own, and tarnish and infect most of the places, such as the cafeteria. The school's reputation could be tarnished as well, and they could lose funding. All in all, a lot of bad things could happen if they were to catch Russell, and this all could have been avoided if Russell didn't jump into Blight's backpack. But I, I get that it was just for 
like plot. But you have to understand that there were a bunch of rats inside that school. So I think in the interest of being fair, that place was probably already having issues as it was. I mean, yeah, I get that the janitor didn't, you know, even know that they were there or, or he just thought they were there. But... I think Russell would just be like the least of everyone's problems considering that there were what like 20 or 30 of like of the same rats in that school. Yeah. Yeah, so I honestly don't really, you know, pin any blame on Russell for this since well, he would just be like a victim of circumstance. I mean, honestly, it's not his fault that this happened. He was just curious and I think everyone would be taking their little daydream too far and not really thinking about the possibility of what could happen. Yeah. Yeah. That's a little nitpick, too. I think this, it's the school drill part. I mean, she just stands there and just doesn't move to the side. Even when they even come back inside the school, she just stood there and tried to pick up her stuff and just <laughs> went, people just ran, ran over her. Yeah, they shouldn't even have trampled her over her in the first place. I know. Yeah. Well, it is possible for people to get trampled or, you know, get, you know, lost in a crowd like that. I mean, I understand that you're probably not going to get battered up like Blight did, but it can still happen if, you know, you got a whole wave of people rushing at you. There is a chance of you getting knocked down and potentially getting trampled. I mean, just look at Walmart on Black Friday. People have been known to get trampled there. And if you can get trampled in Walmart, you can probably get trampled out of school. <laughs> oh, trust me. Uh, I speak from experience. I would have had people trample me, so. All right, so overall, short and sweet. Good episode. Nine out of ten. Great job, Julian Tim. I really do like this episode. This episode, for me, is very memorable memorable for the Zoe and Digby plot, but not so much for the Russell plot. Russell's plot wasn't too interesting for me, and it was kind of a pretty basic going to school and getting lost plot. I also noticed Blythe cut school in order to go back to LPS, which isn't too good academically, but it does uh, help the plot progress. But I still really do like this episode, so I'll give it a 9 out of 10. All in all, Trading Places is a great episode. I couldn't find anything extremely wrong with it, so I can't give it a bad score. Zoe getting Penny Ling to talk to Digby was pretty decent. I've seen scenarios like this before, and I really liked the direction it took. Digby wasn't a terrible day camper. In fact, I'd like to see the skill based pet at least make one comeback one of these days. He's athletic, very caring, and really knows how to work the charm. I found it funny how Digby just flat out asked why Zoe couldn't speak for herself. It felt so appropriate because that's what I was thinking the first time I watched the episode, and I thought the shocking revelation was just around the corner, but instead, this dog starts becoming flirtatious with Penny. Some might say, I don't like it. But to me, it makes sense. I mean, if Zoe can't talk to him, then Digby's going to chase after the one who will. First come, first served, and I like it. Digby was right. Zoe is pretty lucky to have a friend in that panda. And once again, I like it. Russell's school fantasy was pretty funny in hindsight because it's the exact opposite of what would really happen if he entered a school. A trophy for being the smartest hedgehog and scoring the winning points in a football game with what I can say is an illegal use of hands? It's no wonder crazy janitors want him gone. <laughs> it's fun to joke. I don't blame Russell for any of his actions here, because sometimes we've all let our daydreams go to our heads way too much and our expectations don't turn out the way we planned. Given how Russell is the intelligent one of the main pets, his curiosity about attending school with intelligent humans and actually trying to go through with it is not something I'd bash. I mean, if Minka wants to be the first monkey on Mars, Russell can work on his dream of being the first hedgehog to graduate high school. Well, since I mentioned Minka, I'll talk about her next. Seeing Minka trying to keep Mrs. Twombly distracted was one of the earliest Minka scenes I saw before actually watching full-length episodes. And I have to say, it was cute, it was adorable, it was adorably cute. I guess monkeys and doorknobs don't mix. Or do they? Lastly, Blythe being able to make a skateboard that quickly and out of the limited resources she had was a moment that got me thinking. Can she do more things besides fashion? If I can make a skateboard that fast and ride it like it was no one's business, I'd be so happy. She has some hidden potential there and maybe we'll see more of it soon. I'll finish up by saying the B-plot at the pet shop was really enjoyable and very relatable. That is if you've had a crush on someone but needed a third party to do the talking for you, which has happened to me several times in my day. And the A-plot at Blythe School was... Well, not to say it was horrible, but it just wasn't my favorite of the two plots. It did its job correctly, so I'm not throwing this half out the window. But I think once you start using Zoe's tail as a Russell stand-in, you know something cray is going to happen. Even throwing in the Space Odyssey theme and slowing down Russell's jump just makes you want to say, Woo! Ah, gotta love the nature boy. Thank you, Conman, for your weekly icon featuring a legend. 
This is still a great episode, despite not being in my Season 1 Top 10. Speaking of numbers, 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 I'll be giving this episode an 8.5 out of 10. Until next time, I'll say adieu. All right, you pretty much heard most of my thoughts about this episode. It was it was great. Both the A plot and B plot were pretty solid. So when all said and done, I'm going to give this a 9 out of 10. I really loved this episode. It was great. Penny Ling was being a great character, though. And I agree with CC that B should come back one day. It was just an overall good episode. I give it a 9 out of 10. So next week, we're going to be doing Season 2 reviews. So let's see what the randomizer gives us. Bring on the randomizer! Come on, big bucks, big bucks, no whammies! I'm betting all my money. (laughs) And the randomized episode is... A Day at the Museum. Ah! Ah. Uh, Alright. Not one of my favorites. (laughs) It's alright. Well, gee, way to count everything out already. (laughs) <laughs> no, no, no. I, I remember part of this and I remember being bored out of my mind uh, well um, we'll have to wait until good. next week now won't we alright so I guess you know, I, I can sneak CC trainer Ling 16 time world heavyweight champion James the con man and my name is Ethan and we will see you guys next week adios peace out home slices see you later Woo! bye pet shoppers <laughs>